podcasts. Maybe you already love them. Maybe you've never heard one in your life. In the case of the latter, it's simple. Pick up your phone and download one of these apps. If you have an iPhone, this one is already on there and it works just fine. Congratulations and welcome to something that can change your life. Commutes will never be the same. Television quality entertainment with you at all times and it's 100% free. Bear with me, I promise we're getting to the mystery. Now, there are two main types of podcasts. Unscripted, which ranges from interviews with the famous and powerful, to some dudes talking about video games for four hours. There are a lot of these, but fret not, for diamonds in the rough, a plenty. Then, there are scripted podcasts. These range from a simply told story to a documentary-esque production with investigative reporting, big budgets, and excellent sound design. There are fewer of these, as they're often more difficult to make, but they are a delight. And they're free. It's free. Today, I want to talk about a scripted podcast called Mystery Show, made by Gimlet Media. Of everything I've listened to, nothing has ever been so gripping, intriguing, exciting, off the wall, beautiful, gorgeous, fantastic, wonderful, thought-provoking. In fact, it was one of the biggest inspirations for Nothing Is Revealed. To this day, in my mind, it is still the finest podcast ever produced. Let's let the first half of this episode be a short retrospective. I'll talk about each of Mystery Show's landmark six episodes. Then, we'll get to the sad heart of the case. How does a show win iTunes' best new podcast of the year in 2015 and inexplicably vanish a year later. Welcome to Nothing is Revealed. You've probably heard of Serial, right? It's still arguably the most well-known podcast. It inspired a laundry list of true crime mysteries. However, if you limit yourself to morbid crime, you'll miss out on the more grounded human mysteries that have quietly dominated the charts. Hosted by the magnetic, peculiar Starly Kine, Mystery Show simply presented a mystery and then endeavored to solve it. And amazingly, they did nearly all the way nearly every time. I recorded voice tracks in my bedroom and put it all together and I had an episode that I liked at the end and I was really proud of it and it felt really different to me and then I waited four years for Serial to come out basically and people to care about podcasts because like what happened was like <laughs> like it was just like a thing that I was really excited about that literally The first episode Video Store is a good primer for the show. A friend of Starley's rents a movie one night from a thriving blockbuster-esque store. When the friend comes back the next day to return the film, she finds the store shuttered, windows covered in brown paper. Behind the paper, nothing, not even the shelves. As if it had never existed at all. How does a seemingly normal store completely shut down and liquidate overnight, and why? Good mystery, good episode, but it's the weakest of the six total. Still worth listening to, but you'd never guess how insanely good the show would get. Episode two is called Britney. The Britney in question is Britney Spears. Starly Kine has another friend, an obscure writer. The friend's books don't sell well, didn't review well, and were promptly forgotten, which is why the friend is so stunned when she sees a photo online of Britney Spears hounded by paparazzi holding her obscure book. How did Britney get it? The lengths Starly goes to solve this are genuinely impressive. This is the moment when you realize you are listening to something special. Then there's episode three, Belt Buckle. This is the masterpiece of storytelling. A man finds a unique, intricate belt buckle on the street as a child, and years later, wants to know to whom it belonged. I won't say much more, 
other than that this is my favorite audio story of all time. And it's not fiction. It's real. It's playful and sweet and profound, and I well up every time I hear it. Episode 4. A license plate that says, I love 9-11. Why would such a thing exist, and who owns it? This once and for all. Jake, do you mind? Um, we should figure this out. Episode 5. How tall is Jake Gyllenhaal? Such a straightforward question, but surprisingly difficult to answer. My girlfriend, now fiancé, and I drove around the block listening to this episode and laughed and laughed and laughed. Welcome back. Your dreams were your ticket out. Welcome back to that same old place. Finally, episode six, the series finale, featuring the charmingly monotone Jonathan Goldstein. Jonathan saw a metal lunchbox themed with 70s show Welcome Back Cotter. Only the image on the lunchbox perplexed him. It's a hilarious episode, and if you've ever seen an old artifact and wondered about its origins, you'll understand completely. And that's it. No more. Nothing more to listen to, and as of now, there never will be. But this wasn't always the case. I remember refreshing my podcast feed every day for the first episode of season two to drop. The show's Twitter feed went silent for over a year. And then, this ominous tweet. The official cancellation came a few weeks later. Starley wrote a short post on the show's official Facebook page. There's that name again, Gimlet. Maybe the answer lies there. Why should I invest in your podcast company? It's the Cadillac of podcast companies. The people who use Cadillac as a reference. <laughs> Alex, listen, who are you and what are you doing? Go. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to cheer people up. Gimlet Media is one of the largest companies in the podcasting space. This show was based on a Gimlet podcast. They've worked with these celebrities. But they weren't always so fortunate. Gimlet was founded as a startup in 2014 by NPR podcast whiz Alex Bloomberg. Its first two podcasts were relative hits and remain popular to this day. But two hits don't make a network, and its third show would be a home run. But three hits don't make a network either. The company was still fleshing itself out, running on investment money, trying to generate revenue. That's not always easy or obvious in a medium that's 100% free. Gimlet issued a statement right after Starlease. Unsustainable to produce and publish on a consistent basis. Case closed, right? But it's not. I have so many questions. How far was Starly into season two? Will we ever see the fruits of her labor during that year? Supposedly, it was on the table that Starly might produce this show independently, but two years and seven months later, no word. I hate to say it, but is this what Alex Bloomberg meant when he said the show isn't sustainable to produce. I can't imagine how difficult it must have been for both Starly and Alex Bloomberg. Starly's darling brainchild is now half owned by Gimlet, who slapped new ads into the show not too long ago against Starly's wishes. Meanwhile, Mystery Show was exactly the hit a brand new podcast network needed. There's no way Alex Bloomberg wanted to cancel it. The bad PR still lingers to this day. There's a deeply personal story here, not being told. Maybe that's for the best. Maybe all parties involved just want to forget it. But I can't. I can't forget 
how belt buckle made me feel. I can't forget how Starly Kind's singular vision influenced me and so many other podcasts I listen to today. It feels like we're all standing on the shoulders of this storytelling pioneer. And so, in the end, the show, dedicated to solving them, left one mystery behind. When will Mystery Show return?